it's a nice guy like I in a place like this. I asking myself that question now. It's absolutely thundering out of the heavens here. We've been walking about a mile. We've got some nice frogs though. It's all worth it. If you work on exotic animals, you've got to go find them. You can't buy them off the shelf. So just why are these bedraggled biochemists from Northern Ireland chasing frogs in the heart of the Chinese rainforest? In fact, they are harvesting small protein molecules known as peptides. All living cells produce them, frogs secrete them, science is fascinated by them, and humanity needs them. Tropical rainforests are home to more than half the world's plant and animal species. Fifty years ago, they covered 15% of the Earth's land surface. Today, it's nearer 6% and falling. Every 60 seconds, another 25 acres are cut down for timber, cleared or burned. A destruction of habitat that's forcing many species into extinction. And when they go, they take their secrets with them. Secrets that hold untold potential for medicine and human health. These are the places where we find hundreds of different species of frogs. So these are the areas we concentrate upon. And basically what we have done is develop technologies where we can go into the rainforest and without killing or destroying any individual frogs, we can sample their secretions, we can bring them back out of the rainforest habitat into our high technology laboratories. There we can look for new molecules which have exciting properties, be it inhibition of cancer cells, dilation of blood vessels, or a whole variety of other biological systems. Thereby look for, in a sentient sort of way, new lead compounds for drug discovery into the new millennium. The reason we focus upon amphibians is this is an area of scientific research that was pioneered some 40 years ago by two individuals of note. Vittorio or Spammer in Italy, who concentrated on the peptides and frog secretions, and Professor John Daly from the National Institutes of Health, who was interested in the small molecules, the alkaloid molecules, as occurring in the skins of uh, poison arrow frogs. Unfortunately, Professor or Spammer passed away, but Professor Daly is very much alive and kicking. In fact, he has just returned from an expedition to Thailand where he was scaling moss-covered slopes, covered in leeches. And this is the sort of thing you have to do if you want to acquire these particular specimens from, from nature. And when he's not in his Washington research lab, Professor Daly can often be found amid the extensive frog collection in nearby Baltimore. Well, Chris, you've seen one, probably one of the biggest collection of dendrobated frogs in the world. Their breeding wow. is helpless for years. Is this what I think it is? A magic frog? What a specimen. Wow. Looks like one of the Brazilian tree frogs, Phyla medusa. Phyla medusa. This is the one the Indians used in a hunting magic ritual. They get secretion from this frog and they, they burn themselves and rub it into cuts. It makes them rather sick. Uh, and then they go into a trance-like state. But the next day when they wake up, they claim they're greatest hunters in the world then. And they move so slowly, so they have to have a, a really very powerful cocktail of Some, toxins against their predators. Some, something to ward off. Yes. Predators which would find this an easy, easy prey otherwise. It's a what a spectacular frog. species. Frog. These I've heard calling in the, in the forest many times. Yes. And I look up and I say, okay, 60 feet up in yes. the tree, yes. there's yes. a male of these Phylomedusa calling. Well, that does me a lot of good. <laughs> you know, the few I've collected in the wilds are probably just been clumsy ones that have fallen out of the tree. Epibatidine is probably our most exciting finding in the 40 years of working on these, these poison frogs. It was part of an expedition to Ecuador, and we were looking to see what type of compounds were in the poison frogs of Ecuador. Fortunately, when I got back, I took the extract from this one frog and I injected it into a mouse. And the mouse immediately arched its tail up over its back, and I recognized that this as a old test 
for morphine type compounds, the Straub tail test. We collected frogs, we isolated the compounds, but we did not get enough to determine the structure. And we had to wait uh, 20 years until the scientific instruments became sensitive enough to determine what it is. In pursuing it further, we discovered that this was not a morphine type compound but it was a compound with much more potent activity as a painkiller than morphine. For people who suffer from chronic pain, you ask them whether the rainforest is important, and they'll say yes. In our rainforest uh, exhibit here at the National Aquarium of Baltimore, we do display some animals that are critically endangered at this point. One example is the golden lion tamarind, which uh, unfortunately lives a little bit too close to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. The area where it lives is highly populated, and about 90% of its uh, rainforest home has been destroyed. But there is a twist in the tale for this handsome little monkey. Its obvious popular appeal has produced action, not only to protect its habitat, but to extend that protection to neighboring areas. Unfortunately, there's um, an example given with uh, rainforest destruction. It's like a library burning down before we read all the books in the library. That is happening all the time. Because of the destruction, we really have two lists going, the new species being discovered and the ones that we're losing to extinction. I think many of the compounds that we and compounds that Chris Shaw is isolating really show why the biodiversity is so important. What Chris Shaw has looked at is peptides, and he's found that all the frogs in the world are rich sources of peptides, novel peptides, interesting compounds, some of which are found nowhere else in nature, and certainly will open up a whole new era of biological research. There are over 4,000 species of frogs, and here in China, there are several hundred species and probably several hundred more waiting to be discovered. So we're here to collect the secretions from the frogs, take them back to the laboratory and determine what types of molecules are present. Do they have biological effects? I think the frogs are going to be at any high, you know. I think people in the West have got to remember that we don't have any supermarkets here. We're 400 miles inland in Upper Fujian province. And people here have to eat what is available, and people for centuries have been eating these frogs, which are a very good source of protein. These were frogs that were destined for the pot anyhow. But it also conforms with another golden rule in biology, and that is that sooner or later all biologists who work on an animal end up eating it. A farmer who live here, and he catch the snakes and sell to this kitchen. The snake in Chinese it means five-step snake. It means if you uh, was bitten by these snakes, after you walk only five steps, you will die. There's a member of our team who works with snakes, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that he, he would be keen to get his hands on the venom, but uh, you're not going to get me milking these guys. In China, you never know what you might be eating or who might join you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's perfect frog territory, absolutely fantastic. You've got a plentiful supply of water, you've got a lush vegetation, the temperature is just perfect for these animals. This is, this is absolutely fantastic. We're using the local talent here. Uh, the guy is phenomenal. He, he seems to just have a nose for these things. He's in there finding frogs that, that, that I can't even see. You can see some, some, you can see the secretory yeah, yeah. vesicles on yeah. the underside it's, it's, here. It's male. It's female. Uh, it's male. It's a male, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 
another species of uh, corn frog. Yep. Maybe it's even a new species. Mm. Oh, I'll take it Chris is definitely an, a top guy in this field. We have all those frog, frogs running around, but we didn't put our <laughs> focus on those frogs before he came. That, that's a really terrible waste of a good resource. I have a group of, of bright people working in the lab, but they don't have great opportunity to learn, to get better training. Through this joint project, I can see that uh, I would turn my, my group into one of the major peptides research center in China. This for me is one of the pleasures of the job because we get to put the animal back into its environment again. There's no permanent harm has been done to the animal and he's, and he's off back in his natural environment. We've got the secretion and they've got their freedom. The Chinese giant salamander may hold the key to unlock the process of aging of human cells. This creature was probably around long before the dinosaurs. And a very, very interesting group because they seem to live for goodness knows how many years. That This one was probably about a third grown and maybe 12 to 20 years old. So these are very long-lived animals and they may hold some of the secrets of the aging process in cells that we can unravel for aging research. Yeah. It's necessary for the scientists to do just as we have done in the past week go out into the field and actually collect specimens. And of course, this has really taken biology into the real world. Not just ordering things out of chemical catalogues, but going out across the world here in the Far East to actually collect the specimens, remove their secretions, and then synthesize these chemicals without danger to the animal. Previous studies on frog skin peptides necessitated killing the frogs, removing their skin and chemically extracting this. But the development of new technology which facilitates a, a technique which involves simple electrical stimulation of the frog, which is very gentle. Uh, it's equivalent to the current that's used in acupuncture. So this is our tree frog. It's a little Notoria cerulea. White's tree frog. It's a little Australian tree frog. And the first thing that I'm doing is conditioning the skin with a little water. This makes it uh, easier for her to secrete whenever we put the electrodes onto the skin. These are two just um, ordinary electrodes and we're just applying a, a, a minuscule electric current here um, to the skin and what we're doing is we're just causing the muscle under the skin to contract. And once we've done that, we then just wash the secretion off the frog into the beaker. That's it. You can see that our frog is completely unfazed by that. It's quite happy. What we've got here is a fairly complex cocktail of chemicals um, containing uh, peptides, proteins, and biogenic amines and various other alkaloid compounds. The first stage is actually reducing the volume of the venom we take. Because we wash it off with distilled water, we have a reasonably large volume. So we use a technique called lyophilization or freeze drying, which effectively uh, keeps the molecules at a very low temperature so there's no degradation. We remove the water from them under vacuum so we end up with a white powder. Uh, that is then reconstituted in small amounts and subjected to fractionation using a high technology system whereby we can resolve each component 
of the venom. Each frog venom contains a very complex mixture of chemical compounds. And the first stage in our analysis is to separate all those components into the various constituent parts. So the first thing we do is take some of the frog venom, we dissolve it in some water with acid, and then we inject it onto our chromatography system. The chromatography system separates the components. First of all, the small molecules, followed by medium-sized compounds such as peptides and alkaloids, and finally, larger molecular weight compounds such as large peptides and proteins elute blast. Approximately 90% of the liquid is collected and used for further analysis, while roughly 10% goes into a mass spectrometer where we achieve data regarding the size of these compounds. We spot our samples onto a 100 well plate, let them dry with a matrix. Then we put the sample into the machine and we fire a laser at the spot that we're interested in. The sample then goes up the time of flight tube and is detected at the top. And this is what we see on the screen. And we can identify the mass of the peptide we're interested in. This is the third stage in the procedure where we actually sequence the peptide. The peptide is immobilized here. These reagents are then delivered and it's broken down amino acid by amino acid. The amino acids are then chromatographed the here and using the computer we can identify what each one is. And this is the sequence of a very exciting peptide. We see here in residue we have got arginine in position one and if we click on we have a proline in position two and when we come to position three we see we have two peaks. We can test for a whole range of different biological activities. And one of our frogs, Pachymedusa, a frog from Central America, from Mexico, in fact, we screened this frog quite recently and we found that it actually contained at least 14 different vasodilator peptides. We then subsequently went through these one at a time. We determined their structure, and indeed the very first one of these that we structurally characterized turned out to be a new class of frog skin peptide. Biology Unit at the University's Jordanstown campus near Belfast. To test the effect, a small section of artery is removed from a rat's tail. It's then placed in a heater block to maintain normal body temperature and bathed in a nutrient solution which mimics blood. A powerful constricting agent is then added, which narrows the artery and reduces blood flow. Ten minutes later, when maximum pressure is reached in the artery, a solution containing the peptide produced by the frog Pachymedusa is substituted for the constricting agent. Just 30 minutes later, there are significant results. At the moment, we're seeing approximately 50% reduction in blood pressure in this system. This is a real breakthrough. Things like this have never been seen before. The vasoactivity that we're getting at such low concentrations could prove to be very, very vital in developing therapeutic treatments and also in managing regimes. We can now look at delivering drugs to tumours more effectively at lower concentrations of drugs. We can also look at giving it to hypertensive patients to lower their blood pressure, again, at very, very low doses. Pachymedusa is a frog that produces copious amounts of venom. If you look at venoms from other creatures, you will see that they often contain molecules with anticoagulant properties because the introduction of venom into the circulation will often cause blood to clot. So they contain molecules that prevent that so the venom can spread. Hematologist Dr. Billy Gilmore provides a simple demonstration under laboratory conditions. 
First, he takes a sample of normal blood plasma and adds a powerful blood clotting agent. With the sample held at normal body temperature, clotting occurs within 15 seconds. However, when he adds the same clotting agent to a sample which contains the anticoagulant peptide provided by Pachymedusa, there is no clotting. The clock just ticks on and on. Pachymedusa's anticoagulant properties have great potential for the prevention and treatment of deep vein thrombosis and heart disease, two of today's major killers. One of the first peptides discovered by the team came from Cassina maculata from West Africa. Chris was astonished to find its protein was virtually identical to one found in the nervous systems of some insects, a protein known to cause severe hyperactivity in the muscles, ending in total paralysis. The reason the frogs produce this compound, as we found out later, was that their major predators in the African rainforest are giant water insects. And what I mean by that are diving beetles that are maybe uh, 15 centimetres long and that they're capable of taking out half a cubic centimetre of flesh from your big toe if you happen to encounter one while wading through the water. So it's astonishing that even in terms of defending themselves against predators that are invertebrates, that the frogs through the course of evolution have come up with defensive chemicals in their skin. And of course such chemicals are of enormous interest to the biotechnology industry because cloning peptides such as this into either food crops or into plants such as cotton could effectively make that plant resistant to insect attack, which means you don't have to spray insecticides randomly in the environment. Latoria cerulea and allied frogs of that particular family, which occur in Australia, contain a vast number of peptides that have potent antibiotic activities. And very early on in the study of these frogs, we determined that their activity was not just directed against ordinary common or garden organisms, but they were equally effective at killing some multiple drug resistant human pathogens, those that cause human disease and that effectively cannot be treated by conventional antibiotics. These compounds work in a completely new and different way to traditional antibiotics. This is very important at the moment because of the ever increasing number of resistant organisms that are emerging worldwide. And our compounds, they work in a way that microbes cannot become resistant to them. One of the reasons for this is the way in which the antibiotic molecules work. They embed themselves in the membrane of the bacterium and they form pores. Effectively, they burst the cell. For this North American frog, Rana pipiens, the giant leap is towards the treatment of cancers. Molecules secreted from its skin have proved to be from a similar source to the so-called messenger molecules produced in the human body, which are known to either stimulate or discourage the growth of tumours. When we screened a frog called Ranopepians, we found a peptide that had profound effects on inhibiting the growth of tumour cells from a wide range of different tumours. We also determined it had a receptor for this peptide, a binding protein on the membrane of the tumour cell. Uh, this peptide also inhibits the differentiation of bone marrow cells into white blood cells. So such a molecule may have implications in, for instance, the treatment of leukaemia, the arresting of the damage to the bone marrow during chemotherapy, and a wide range of other applications, perchance, in the treatment of cancer. And the success stories continue. Each new peptide that is isolated and analysed presents an exciting new discovery to the University of Ulster team. And each has the potential to be one more giant leap for medical science. Traditionally, the shaman or the medicine men in native tribes pass this type of medicinal information down to their sons, to their grandsons. Now in our high technology generation, the same thing actually happens. One young scientist obtains inspiration from an older scientist and carries that through to his students 
and passes that on through generation to generation. And if one goes back to the concept of the rainforest, one looks at the rainforest, at the animals, at the plants, at the beautiful flowers, and one thinks as a human, this is a beautiful place. But one must remember that the rainforest is a battleground, that for millions of years, each organism that exists in the rainforest has been vying with every other organism for survival. It's basically a case of biological warfare. What I think is very, very important is that we as human society use that biological weaponry that has been evolved over millions of years and we use that to put that against the things that are a real threat to humankind. Cancer, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases. I believe that the cures for these exist in the rainforest, in the molecules that have evolved over millions of years in the organisms. So basically what I'm saying is that I believe we can put those weapons to use for the good of humankind in the ultimate defeat of these diseases which so far have remained intractable.